The events of the movie start on July 14, winning 789, a pivotal day in France's history. Sidonie Labord wakes up from the ringing of her clock, currently lent to her by Madame Campan. The clock has done its job of waking her on time. She scratches her arm, where rashes have occurred, either from mosquito bites or from bed bugs. Among all the servants, Sidonie is the only one to have such a luxurious item. That's why her friend, Louison, is fascinated and wants to get a glimpse of it. By the time Sidonie is all dressed up, she's already running late. Ten minutes, according to Madame Campan, who happens to be the Queen's Lady of the Bedchamber. This does not bode well, as they could be subjected to the Queen's unpredictable whims. As they hurry towards the Queen's chambers, a lady of great standing comes out of it. She's Duchess Gabrielle de Polignac, well known as the Queen's favorite. And the Duchess knows it based on her arrogant and confident strides. Among the servants, it's an unwritten rule to never talk about what they've seen or their implications. But that's not always the case within the monarchy. Madame Campan instructs Sidonie on how to behave in front of the queen, and she also discusses what books she should read. Sidonie is the queen's reader, and it's her job to soothe her with passages from novels, plays, or anything the queen wishes to hear. Then, finally, Sidonie enters the room. Even when she has just woken up, Marie Antoinette looks glowing and pleasing. Hints of her easygoing personality show when she expresses her gratitude for Sidonie's early arrival. In response, Sidonie says she'll take longer journeys. If that's what the Queen wants, Sidonie is a believer in the monarchy, and she adores Queen Marie Antoinette very much. Soon, after settling on a book to read, Sidonie fetches it from the library and starts reading to the Queen. Halfway through the book, Sidonie feels a bit uncomfortable with the Queen's closeness to her. But Marie Antoinette simply feels relaxed, as she is fond of her reader. The Queen notices Sidonie scratching her arm, so she orders Madame Campan to fetch rosewood water for her. It's a small gesture for the Queen. But for Sidonie, it's a privilege to see this compassionate side of the woman who has become increasingly unpopular within the court and among her people. When the queen starts looking through a book of fabrics, Sidonie knows it's time to leave. She takes one last look at the queen, who seems to have forgotten her in a heartbeat. Sidonie spends her free time basking in the sun while riding a slow-moving gondola. However, her relaxing time gets interrupted when her hand brushes a floating rat carcass. To take her mind off it, she asks the gondolier what he's singing about. He's being coy about it, and Sidonie scoffs, Along the banks of the lake, they see a palanquin passing by. Everyone knows that Gabrielle de Polignac is inside it, including the gondolier, who now shares with Sidonie some unwanted and malicious rumors about the Duchess. He says the Queen is infatuated with her, and the Duchess couldn't care less about her husband. Rumors about the Duchess center around immoral behaviors. There's a hint of pride in the gondolier's voice as he implies that he and the Duchess do things when they ride the gondola privately. He even challenges Sidonie, saying that soon, Gabrielle will ditch her servant to ride with him. Sidonie doesn't want to hear more, as it taints the queen's reputation in her mind. When they get back to the lakeside, the gondolier's words come true as Gabrielle orders her servant to stay there. As the duchess rides the gondola, her servant makes a remark that bothers Sidonie. She says bread seems to get scarcer and scarcer in Paris. When there's no more left, the wolves leave the forest. Sidonie confronts the servant, who tells her the rumors she hears are the truths she looks at. Sidonie takes it that the servant means the monarchy doesn't care about the shortage of food for the common people. This prompts her to defend the idea that Versailles, where the monarchy is, is safer than anywhere else. To understand Sidonie's view and the servant's remark, let's take a look at the context of the movie. As said earlier, July 14th is a pivotal day in France's history because it was when the Bastille was stormed by the people, marking the beginning of the French Revolution. People attacked the military fortress because it represented the French monarchy for the things they resented the government for. King Louis XVI was slowly losing his grip on power, and Queen Marie Antoinette continued to become unpopular. But the news of the attack hadn't reached Versailles yet, so the people there, including everyone inside the palace, were still oblivious to the fact that the monarchy was on the brink of its downfall. In the next scene, we see Sidonie helping her other friend, Honorine, finish an embroidery. And then, later on, we see the servants having a merry time, with not a care in the world. In the wee hours of July 15th, the servants are all woken up by a commotion. Someone dared to wake up the king at two in the morning. Louison knocks on Sidonie's door to tell her about it. 
everyone is curious as to why the king had to be woken up at such an odd hour, unless it's an urgent and worrying matter. Later during breakfast, it is Honorine who tells them the insider information. She says she heard it from Mr. Mrs. De La Tour de Pen, who kept mentioning the word, Bastille, but she couldn't understand everything, because the conversation she heard was in English. Nonetheless, she has deduced that something bad has happened there. Lewison says she'll ask her lover, who is part of the Swiss Guard. Sidonie aims to ask Monsieur Moreau, the court secretary. But first, she meets Madame Burton. Madame Burton is the Queen's fashion advisor. She is looking for someone who can embroider a Dahlia sampler, as per the Queen's request, since her own servant is ill. On Madame Campan's recommendation, Sidonie is called due to her embroidery skills. However, the Queen doesn't know she is good at it. Sidonie uses this knowledge to barter with Madame Burton. She will embroider the sample, but in return the Madame should tell her why the King was woken up at two. From her expression, Madame Burton knows about it, and is surprised at being asked. So she shares with Sidonie that people storm the Bastille, and the Queen was told about it. The Madame adds that the Queen has sent a regiment towards Paris, which the King didn't like. This whole embroidery task is simply the Queen's way to alleviate her anxiety about the situation. Now that she knows the general idea, it's time for Sidonie to get the details. So she heads to the library, where she finds Monsieur Moreau. As expected, the old hunchback man knows what has happened. He says that yesterday, a munitions convoy headed towards the Bastille was attacked by rioters, who pillaged the fortress afterward. The French guards were immediately defeated, and the prison commander was beheaded. Moreau says it is predicted that rebellions will happen all over the kingdom. Versailles will be next. Sidonie is at a loss for words. It's understandable when she asks the old man about their fate at this point. Sidonie tries to keep her mind off the ominous event by focusing on the embroidery work given to her by Madame Burton. As she looks at the finery book, she relays to Honorine what she has learned. Then, the de la tour de pins walks into the room, speaking in English. Honorine tries to eavesdrop, but all she can understand is the word, polygnac. She assumes they are referring to the Queen's favorite Duchess. Honorine mocks Gabrielle de Polignac, accusing her of playing her cards right in court. From her perspective, no one gets promoted from a so-called country bumpkin to the Queen's favorite unless immorality is involved. She even calls the Duchess a whore. Distressed, Sidonie keeps shushing her. Sidonie can't bear to hear malicious rumors about the Queen. She can clearly see that the association between Marie Antoinette and Gabrielle is bringing them maliciousness, which makes her wish the two women would be more conscientious about their actions. Honorine keeps teasing Sidonie, knowing her great adoration for the queen. Sidonie stands up by the window. That's when she notices the king coming out to the courtyard, along with his advisors. They see King Louis and his advisors not wearing their royal garb. Soon, by the ringing of the bells, everyone in the palace knows that the king will be marching to Paris. Most of the servants are curious, so they follow the royal entourage. However, when they get to the platform where the king is supposed to have his speech, they aren't allowed up by the Swiss guards. It so happens that Louison is intimately close with Gustav, one of the guards. Sidonie makes an offer to Louison. She will lend her the luxurious clock she has for the night, in exchange for letting her into the gates. Louison agrees, and she flirts with Gustav to let Sidonie enter. Once inside, Sidonie listens intently to the king's words. That night, Sidonie is still anxious about the effects of the attack on the Bastille. She keeps embroidering, even forgetting to have her dinner. Alice knocks to check in on her. Eventually, she expresses her thoughts. She hugs her friend as she says she fears for the queen's safety. Sidonie visits Monsieur Moreau again, bringing him food. They have been close since she started working as the Queen's reader. Among all the palace's inhabitants, only he can understand her passion for reading, and give her allowance for her adoration of the Queen. She expresses her concerns about what happened yesterday, and her worries about the Queen's well-being. On this, Moreau gives her a warning. She shouldn't let her blind love for the Queen overtake her sensibilities, because this makes her too indulgent to the latter's caprice. He also calls Gabrielle de Polignac the Queen's folly and warns that her relationship with the Duchess will cost her dearly. Later, Sidonie accompanies him outside the library. They find the hallway filled with people. Both the court's members, nobles, and their servants have not retired to bed. They are all buzzing about Bastille, now that they know what happened. Everyone is waiting for a signal to decide whether they should leave or stay. 
But for Sidonie, the choice is obvious. She'll stay for the queen. She sits at the side and closes her eyes. When she opens them, she finds herself in the same place. But something is different. She runs to a nearby group of people. They are huddled over a piece of paper. Their whispers echo their fears and despair. One of them talks to Sidonie, ordering her to warn the queen. As it happens, the rebels who storm the Bastille have created a hit list of people who need to be taken down to usher in the new dawn of governance. The top two people on the list are Marie Antoinette and her brother-in-law, Count D'Artois. The list also includes Gabrielle de Polignac and several members of the court, including the man talking to Sidonie. Wasting no time, she rushes off to the royal quarters, but on her way, she finds Monsieur Moreau drunk on the stairs. In his drunken state, he tells Sidonie the wolves are looking for her. When she asks who they are, she sees the gondolier walking up the stairs. He suddenly flirts with her. For some unknown reason, Sidonie receives the signal. She grabs his hand and pulls him through the hallway that is still filled with people. Then she pushes him inside an empty room, and they start making out intensely. They only stop when Alice finds her and berates her. Apparently, the Queen's pageboy has been looking for Sidonie for several minutes. Appalled, she immediately runs towards the Queen's quarters. When she arrives, she sees the Queen sitting by the fireplace. She gives the look of a person trying to hide her distress by appearing nonchalant. She is reading letters, some of which she throws into the fire. At the other side of the room, Madame Campan beckons her to come. They enter an adjacent room. There, she orders Sidonie to list some of the Queen's favorite books to bring to the country. Sidonie is surprised to learn that the Queen intends to run away. Madame Campan doesn't deny nor confirm this, and instead urges her to do her task. Another woman enters the room. She's Madame de Rotteriel, Campan's friend. She helps the maids pack the Queen's things for her journey. As Sidonie writes her list, she overhears Rotteriel estimating the prices of the Queen's camisoles that she's folding. She says Her Majesty won't notice anything if they steal a few valuable garments. Campan tells her to be quiet. Sidonie looks at the second woman with scorn. How dare she steal the queen's property, she thinks. Later, Campan tells her the queen wants to see her. Marie Antoinette is still burning papers. When she senses Sidonie beside her, she gives her orders. Sidonie must use geography books from the library, and then map the best route from Versailles to Metz. Before she can respond, a messenger runs into the room giving the queen a piece of paper. It is the list of people wanted by the rebels. Marie Antoinette crumples it and throws it onto the fire. The messenger tells her the king will consult his advisors the next day on whether he should stay or leave. He also informs her that a court member has left the palace disguised as a groom. Marie Antoinette lashes out at him, saying she won't disguise herself as anyone but the Queen of France. After sending the messenger away, the queen heaves a heavy sigh. She can't believe ordinary people have the nerve to order the king what they want. Then, noticing that Sidonie is still there, she asks her to take a seat. The expression on the queen's face changes from that of distress to sadness coupled with longing. She asks Sidonie if she has ever been attracted to a woman, to the point that she suffers from her absence. She then continues to describe that woman's face and the feel of her skin how that woman resides in the palace like she was born in it. The queen admits that she's a prisoner of her intense attraction to that woman. Sidonie believes the queen is talking about Gabrielle de Polignac. Yet, the queen doesn't get angry at her assumption. Instead, she becomes confused. She mentions that earlier, she sent Madame Campan to fetch the Duchess, but the Duchess refused to come because she's upset. Seeing the worry on the queen's face, Sidonie wants to soothe her. She immediately volunteers to fetch the Duchess, at that point, she's happy to do anything for the queen. She reaches the quarters of Gabrielle de Polignac. The servant confirms her mistress is fast asleep, having taken two opium seeds earlier. Despite this, Sidonie forces herself into the room. There, she sees the Duchess lying naked in bed, sound asleep. Sidonie can see why the queen fell for the Duchess. Gabrielle has a carefree aura that the queen envies. Gabrielle is free to walk around and do as she pleases, something Marie Antoinette could never do, given her position in court. Seeing that it's not possible to wake the Duchess, Sidonie returns to the Queen's quarters. The Queen asks her if she has done her task, to which Sidonie replies she's sleeping deeply in her room. The Queen turns to her, incredulous. She clarifies that she's asking about the route map she was supposed to make. Sidonie is shocked and incredibly confused. 
she watches as the queen wears her bracelets, while beside her, Madame Campan is trying to remove the jewels from their settings. That's when she realizes that whatever the queen feels inside, she still does whatever she wants to do, without regard to anything at all, and everyone around her is subject to her unpredictable and sometimes unthinkable whims. Sidonie is no different, and her admiration means nothing to the queen. She whimpers as she helps remove the bracelets from the queen's arm. The latter tries to comfort her, and says she won't abandon her. Sidonie suddenly wakes up. She finds herself in a different hall. She's confused whether everything she's just seen is real, or just part of her dreams. The next day, everything looks the same. The servants are up and about in their routine, as if there's no national crisis that's currently happening. Rumors are still flying around about the attack, which makes Sidonie remark that the queen is right to leave for the Mets. But Honorine contradicts her, saying the queen is still in the palace. So when Moro enters the kitchen, she asks him about the queen. Moro says she's attending the cabinet at this moment. Later, Sidonie rushes to the court, along with the other nobles. A few moments later, everyone attending the cabinet, including the king and the queen, comes out of the room. Moro informs Sidonie that the king has chosen to stay, instead of fleeing as expected. This doesn't please anyone, as they think the king can't do any more about the situation. As one of the officers says as he passes by them, the king is a prisoner of the insurrection, and their government is about to face their doom. Later, the Duchess de Polignac walks brazenly among them, toward the queen, looking immaculate in her green gown. They embrace each other, not caring about the judging and hateful looks on everyone's faces. Later, Madame Campan calls Sidonie to go to the queen's quarters to read a book, even though Gabrielle is with her at the moment. When they get there, they see the queen removing her makeup. She looks angry, mortified, and scared. Apparently, she will be staying with the king there, and she doesn't like it. She sits beside Gabrielle and seeks her comfort. For Marie Antoinette, nothing is more satisfying than the solace in Gabrielle's arms. She wishes she could have the Duchess by her side all the time. But it's not allowed, not in their case. Alas, the Queen tells Gabrielle what must be done. She says the hate surrounding them is not exaggerated. The court looks at them maliciously, and the common people want their heads cut off. She relays the news about the unfortunate woman whose life ended because the people mobbed her, and they mobbed her because they thought she was Gabrielle de Polignac. The queen fears for her dear friend's life, so she beseeches her to leave France. Gabrielle is shocked, but she understands that she must stay safe for the sake of the queen. For the last time, Marie Antoinette hugs Gabrielle. The latter pleads not to allow her to leave, but the queen has already considered it done, Without any more words, Gabrielle leaves Marie Antoinette mourning their fate. Sidonie, Campan, and the other servants have heard their conversation, and are awkward about the Queen crying. A few minutes later, Louis XVI arrives. Sidonie hides among the luggage so she can hear them. From the conversation, she learns that a new mayor has been elected in Paris, and he requests the King to go there and make the necessary political announcements. Marie Antoinette won't let him go alone. Despite her infatuation with Gariel, she truly and deeply cares for her husband and their children. She wants him to be accompanied by guards, but the king has made up his mind. Tomorrow he will go to Paris, bringing with him a few for his entourage, and fulfill the wishes of his people. In the middle of the night, Alice barges into Sidonie's room and wakes her up. She's trembling in terror as she informs Sidonie that her mistress has in her life. She asked her husband to watch the corpse while she gets help. It seems like Sidonie is more concerned about not knowing that her friend is already married, rather than the demise of one of the nobles. Regardless, she accompanies Alice to get some help. But they stop in their tracks when Sidonie spots the queen walking along the corridor. She knocks on doors, calling for occupiers, but she receives no response. Sidonie and Alice go straight to Monsieur Moreau's quarters. There, the man and his wife get up to lend help to the helpless maid. Honorine prepares their clothes. Just then, they hear noises from outside. Looking through the window, they see several carriages parked just below them, waiting for their passengers. They recognize most of the men scurrying into the vehicles, and it dawns on Sidonie that most members of the court have chosen to flee. That's why no one is answering the queen's calls. Honorine returns with the garments, and after the Moros get dressed, they accompany Alice to her mistress's quarters. Sidonie turns to Honorine and asks why no one has told her about Alice's marriage. Honorine tells her the harsh truth. It's because Sidonie hasn't told them anything about her. 
So why would they bother telling her about the marriage? Sidonie is relatively unknown to many of the servants. All that's known about her is her love for reading, and for the queen. Sidonie realizes that even she doesn't know who she really is. She runs back to her room. On July 17th, the inhabitants of the palace witness the queen and her children bidding the king goodbye. Among them are Sidonie, Madame Campan, and Madame Burton. They feel sorry for the royal family, and wonder whether they'll ever reunite again. Sidonie gives the finished embroidery to Madame Burton, an exemplary job. After that, she follows Madame Campan to the queen's quarters. The latter orders her to wait in the hallway. While waiting, she hears people talking in a nearby room. When she checks, she finds Gabrielle and her husband complaining about wearing servants' clothes. Discarded on the chair is the green gown she wore yesterday. Distracting her is Campan, who tells her to enter the queen's room. But before she does, the old lady tells her something akin to concern, that she should refuse whatever the queen asks of her. But Sidonie says she can't refuse her. When she enters, she sees the queen admiring the embroidery she did. The queen still doesn't know it was Sidonie who did it and it's unknown why the latter is keeping it that way. After going around the bush, the queen gets directly to the point. She wants Sidonie to accompany Gabrielle de Polignac on her escape to Switzerland. But, she will wear the duchess's clothes and pose as her, while Gabrielle and her husband will pose as her servants. The queen thinks the people will spare the servants, if ever they catch the carriage carrying the duchess. Sidonie succinctly expresses what the queen wants that she wants her to be a bait, the queen despises this, but Sidonie is being a smart mouth with her, perhaps for the first time since she's known her. The queen berates her for her arrogance. She thinks she's allowing Sidonie to earn her love, when in truth, she only sees her as a nobody who's at her beck and call. Sidonie feels her love for the queen slowly turn to resentment, even if she explains that she's the only one she trusts, which is why the queen told her about her secret love for Gabrielle. Sidonie can't find it in herself to justify the queen's actions. Sidonie resigns herself to her impending fate. As Madame Burton undresses her, she feels hollow inside, because her reason for existence has ordered her to her doom. Soon, she's dressed up as Duchess de Polignac. Before she leaves, the queen calls her. She asks her if she can tell Gabrielle that she won't forget her. With that, she gives Sidonie a final kiss. Sidonie looks like a noble woman, so much so that a maid passing her by bows to her before realizing who she is. She sees the Polignacs waiting for her downstairs. Despite her clothes, Gabrielle looks haughty and condescending. Eventually, they all ride the carriage, and are now on their way to Switzerland. For Sidonie, she takes the time to appreciate the scenery they pass by. She expects the Polignacs to abandon her when they reach their destination so she's maximizing the time she has left. She had never gone to any place other than the palace, so the journey is a novelty to her. She looks out of the window and waves at passers-by. This irritates Gabrielle, and she demands her to mind her actions. But Sidonie won't listen. After all, she's not ordered to follow the Duchess. Fed up with her stubbornness, Gabrielle pulls her down and puts a blanket over her. It's already nighttime when she gets up. She looks in her mirror, and is relieved to find that she is still herself. She wakes the Polignacs as she notices the carriage has stopped for a possible inspection. A guard opens the door and inquires about their destination. Sidonie tells him they are headed to Basel to meet some relatives. She shows him her safe pass, and tells him she's traveling with her servant and valet. The guard intently scrutinizes everyone inside the carriage. But Sidonie's indifferent aura convinces the guard that she's the real Duchess de Polignac. He eventually allows them to pass. As the carriage continues its journey, we hear her last monologue. Her name is Sidonie Labord, who used to be the queen's reader. She obeys the queen. Soon, she'll be out of Versailles. Soon, there will be no one.